Okay, we're starting over. Um, I am pleased to welcome you all. Welcome to our audience today. Um, we are hosting a live session with a team of experts um, about the um, China's propaganda and how it, it influences so many parts of our lives. Um, so we're delighted to be hosting this session today. Um, we are launching a new campaign, um, which is Cancel China's Propaganda, and this briefing is the start of, of our um, campaign, um, which will be, uh, which I will show you at the end of the session. Um, I'm going to hand over to Gloria, who is going to be our moderator for today, who will give you a little bit more background. Thanks, Mandy. Hi, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I'll be moderating um, today's session on behalf of the International Tibet Network. Um, just to give you an initial brief overview of the speakers that we have today, um, we've got Sophie Richardson, who is the China Director at Human Rights Watch. We have Zumrate Arkin, who is the Advocacy Manager at the World Uyghur Congress. We have John Jones, um, the Campaign and Advocacy Manager at Free Tibet. And then we have two panelists joining us from Australia, um, Kinzum Dongyu, who is the executive officer at the Australian Tibet Council, and Drew Pavlu, who is a student and activist at the University of Queensland. Um, so as a brief introduction to the topic being discussed, today's briefing is the launch of a global campaign pressing international media outlets to cancel their deals with um, Chinese state-run media, both China Daily and the Beijing Review, who have struck deals with at least 30 foreign newspapers, including The Economist and The Wall Street Journal. Um, the Chinese government develops these uh, partnerships to promote their propaganda overseas and to shape international coverage on China. It's well known that the Chinese government severely suppresses freedoms at home. Um, what is becoming increasingly apparent are Beijing's efforts to undermine human rights globally. So the panel is going to bring together voices from a number of uh, different affected communities who will be highlighting China's growing influence, not just on our media, but also on our educational systems and on our civil society activism. They'll be raising awareness about how we can oppose the Chinese government's encroachment into our institutions and, in fact, why we should oppose them. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to invite John Jones from Free Tibet uh, to open this discussion and tell us about exactly what it is that the Chinese government is up to when it comes to our media. John, you may have to unmute yourself just in case. I see that you're still muted. Hi, thanks, Gloria. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can hear you perfectly. I can. Okay, I think there's a small, small delay on. persevere and hopefully it will be okay and technically so uh, in this party propaganda and to flesh out some slides uh, on the US branch of so the Chinese the biggest news agencies are controlled by the party a clearly defined purpose, one that was summarized by the president of China Central Television in 2000. I don't know if everyone else can hear you, John, but I'm getting quite a lag on my end. Um, so yeah. it might be speaking slightly slower um, so that we can go through. Yeah, a lot of that helps. Okay, I'm going to turn my video off. This is good. Um, okay. 
So I'll just pick up where I say that the, can you hear me now? Okay. That's much clearer. Okay. So, so maybe you can just go back to the start. Chinese so communist... run yes. So I think I queued up a presentation and then I, I just started saying that the Chinese Communist Party dominates the media in the People's Republic of China. They're the biggest news agencies, they're controlled by the party and they have a clearly defined purpose. Uh, one that was summarized by the president of China Central Television in 2011, when he said quality and professional ethic of media staff. The understanding in their role clearly and being a good mouthpiece. A big shock that an authoritarian regime would system of cover reduction of publications such as China Daily and Beijing going fine one of the most on earth is in fact a happy place uh, 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 oh, oh no, if I cut out again. Your signal is cutting in and out, I'm afraid, John. My suggestion is that we do John's section and um, hope that he can join us back for the Q&A at the end. Um, Gloria, do you want me to read through his presentation? That would be um, that would be great, Mandy, if you could. Sure. Okay. I'm going to go back. Okay, I hope everyone can, can hear me. Um, I will go through John's presentation and hopefully he'll be back by the end. Um, one of the key topics of this briefing is the presence of the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda in international media. To flesh out, this presentation we're going to show has some slides. The Chinese Communist Party dominates the media in the, public's, the People's Republic of China. The biggest news agencies are controlled by the party and they have a clearly defined purpose, one that was summarised by the president of the China Central Television in 2011. He said, the first social responsibility and professional ethic of media staff should be understanding their role clearly and being a good mouthpiece. It isn't surprising that an authoritarian regime would subject its citizens to this carefully managed system of cover-up and propaganda. It also isn't surprising that an authoritarian regime may decide to invest huge efforts into public relations. The CCP oversees the production of publications of international readers such as the China Daily and the Beijing Review. If you are so inclined, you can read them online and learn that Tibet is one of the most, Tibet, one of the most repressive places on earth, is in fact a happy place that has been undergoing the process of democratic reform ever since it was invaded and occupied 70 years ago. No human rights abuses are to be seen here. These state outlets will also tell you that the mass internment camps holding millions of Uyghurs are actually nothing more 
than a vocational training centre that bring hope. When it comes to pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong, you can see for yourself, this is the Hong Kong that the China Daily promotes. What may surprise viewers, assuming they don't already know what's going on, is that this has been going on for several years. This propaganda has been available in shops near you every day. And not in copies of the China Daily that sit on the shelves gathering dust. Over the past decade, you will have been able to find these articles praising the CCP, written by the CCP, in the Wall Street Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Economist, the Sydney Morning Herald, and scores of other newspapers around the world. You can see on this map, researched by The Guardian, where these newspapers are located and how many millions are produced. In The Economist recently, you may have seen advertorials called China Focus, or you might have missed them. They're marked as adverts, but they look just like articles. Several of these have appeared recently lauding the CCP's response to the coronavirus outbreak. This content comes from Beijing Review, a product of China's international publishing group, which is controlled by the Communist Party of China. Readers of the Wall Street Journal, and until recently, the New York Times and the UK's Daily Telegraph, may have spotted the China Watch logo. China Watch repackages content from the China Daily, both online and as an insert in the hard copy newspapers. No journalism is required. Some pieces are much easier to spot than others. These newspapers don't run this content out of some kind of admiration for Xi Jinping. But in fact, they run but in fact, they run these pieces. In fact, many of these pieces are run, are run critical pieces also of the CCP, written by diligent professional journalists. They run them because they have struck deals with China. Um, worth hundreds of thousands of pounds, sometimes millions of dollars. In the US alone, the China Daily has reportedly paid $19 million to newspapers over the past four years, including $6 million to the Wall Street Journal, $4.6 million to the Washington Post, and 50000 to the New York Times. In return, the Chinese government can promote their trade policies. It can plant stories about how great its response to the COVID-19 has been. As we can see in this screenshot taken by BuzzFeed, to find. Um, as we can see in the screenshot taken by BuzzFeed News earlier this year, we can assert the territorial claims, like this double page advert that it ran in the New York Times all the way back in 2012. Terribly sorry, I have no idea what page I'm supposed to be on. Newspapers need money to survive and to let the real journalists do their real journalism. But when the funds are coming from an authoritarian government, it really is worth, is it worth the reputational risk to regurgitate CCP propaganda? Is it worth undermining the work of journalists based in China who work hard to uncover the truth of human rights abuses? By running articles claiming the CCP is protecting Tibet's environment, when, when any Tibetan free to do so would tell you that they are really digging up for purposes of mining and extraction, having forcibly relocated millions of Tibetan nomads. How do the journalists and readers of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal feel when they run this content describing one of the horrors of our time? The mass internment of Muslims in the Uyghur region and the law-based campaign of de-radicalization. Luckily, I can end this presentation with some good news to balance out all of this state propaganda. 
we are winning. For years, people on this panel have been challenging the likes of the Telegraph and the New York Times and the Washington Post, asking them why they are serving their readers this reheated propaganda. In March this year, the Telegraph cut ties with the China Daily, following the lead of the New York Times and the Washington Post. This is a clear sense of momentum here, an opportunity to convince our newspapers to back away from China Watch and to stop the PR work it is doing for the regime that Reporters Without Borders has found to be amongst the worst of the worst when it comes to press freedom. This content does not belong in our newspapers. Tibetans, Uyghurs and other people under occupation are denied their freedom to tell the world about their daily lives. The CCP is exploiting this space to speak on their behalf, to lie about them. Not only should the content be scrapped across the board, but these newspapers should double their efforts to bring the voices of Hong Kongers, Tibetans, Uyghurs and Chinese dissidents to their readers. They need our attention. They need our support. Thanks, Mandy. Um, and thank you for delivering that on behalf of John. Um, I know that you had to jump in there at very last minute. Um, but yeah, thank you for talking us through just how pervasive Chinese propaganda is in our media and for highlighting that this is really something of global concern, as we saw by that Guardian map. The irony is, as you've shown through those articles, is not that human rights aren't being discussed in these inserts. Uh, they are. It's just that they've been totally manipulated so that one of the world's biggest human rights violators is suddenly being discussed as bringing democracy to occupy Tibet, or as you mentioned, the law-based transformations in Xinjiang, ignoring the mass um, repression in East Turkestan and the arbitrary detention of, of Uyghur and Uyghurs and other Muslims. Um, building on the point of, of repression as well and, and in East Turkestan, I'd like to invite Zumrate from the World Uyghur Congress to come in on another aspect of China's influence and to speak about how the Chinese government seeks to exert that influence by cracking down on civil society and specifically in this case on Uyghur activists overseas. I hope everyone can yeah, okay. Um, thanks, Mandy and John, for your uh, presentation. Um, so, for Uyghurs, um, the Uyghur community faces frequent uh, reprisals from China, whether it's for those living inside the region with the current crackdown or abroad. Um, so, abroad, uh, the Uyghur community um, is continuously harassed, intimidated, and reprimanded by China for um, denouncing the oppression of Uyghurs inside East Turkestan and all the human rights violations occurring right now. Um, the Chinese government uh, frequently uses hostage diplomacy to try to silence Uyghurs um, abroad by using their family members who are still living in the region. Um, and we can confirm that with the leaked official documents um, over the past few months, especially the Karakash list that was leaked in, in February, um, and we know that communicating with family members overseas is a sufficient reason um, for Uyghurs to be detained in internment camps. And um, civil society actors and human rights defenders abroad um, face immense pressure and threats for their activism. The World Uyghur Congress, um, as an international organization dedicated to advocating for Uyghur human rights, we have faced uh, multiple threats over the years, whether it's digital um, attacks or pressures in international forums. Um, so I, I just thought that I might, might maybe highlight some of the cases. So the World Uyghur Congress president, Adolfan Isa, has been a long critic of the communist regime and a very prominent figure in the Uyghur human rights advocacy. And China's efforts to silence Mr. Isa since he fled the country in 1994 has been persistent um, up until now. His name has been repeatedly smeared across the world. Um, they frame him as a terrorist, as, as a separatist. That kind of led Interpol to use, uh, issue him a red notice in 1997. And that was only removed 20 years later with the help of uh, international pressure. 
and this made this notice was a major obst obstacle for him uh, inhibiting international travel hindering activism and as a result he was detained in south korea in 2009 in italy in 2017 and he is still banned from entering South Korea, Taiwan, Turkey, and India. Um, and even he was prevented on more than one occasion from participating in international meetings, such as the UN Forum on Indigenous Issues, although he had official accreditation. Um, and then he, he, his attempts to seek accountability at the UN have been frustrated by the bullying and blocking tactics of China um, diplomats, official diplomats were following him inside the UN um, and even um, former officials at the UN, Chinese officials, were bragging about um, banning him from these uh, forums back in China on national TV. So, and because of all of that, um, his mother was targeted, detained, and even died in an internment camp because of his activism two years ago. Um, and this January, we also learned that his dad uh, died under unknown circumstances and his family back in East Turkestan have been uh, forced to denounce his work on Chinese propaganda outlets. And he had received um, tar uh, threats from regional officials um, and even in Munich, he was targeted. Um, and that goes to say that, you know, for him, it, he's a prominent activist, but th these kind of um, harassment tactics are even used on ordinary Uyghur citizens that are just um, ordinary advocates or um, activists. And I know this because my own father, who is an ordinary activist, was detained and interrogated for hours by the police upon his return to East Turkestan when he went um, in 2013 for the first time after 20 years to visit his family. And he actually had a Canadian passport, but even with that, uh, the police didn't care. Um, they he he asked them. He was asked to be a, a spy inside the Uyghur community in Canada, in Montreal, and report back to these officials. Um, and he had to go every few days to the police station to, um, you know, report uh, or hear them or in, be interrogated by them. They had a huge file about his activities and about the um, Uyghur Canadians in, in Canada. And upon his return to Canada, we, he received calls from the same officials. Um, and that kind of uh, happened over, the, um, over a few months. And we, of course, uh, reported all, all of this incident um, to the Canadian uh, authorities. Um, and personally, I when I started uh, working at the World of Congress in September, I lost contact with my family completely. Um, I still have my my close family are abroad, but my other family members are still in East Turkestan, and I can't talk with them. Any communication is cut. Uh, my aunt, I learned that my aunt was uh, being interrogated by the police because of my activism. Um, so that just goes to say that these reprisals are very common in our community, in the Tibetan community as well. And even outside of China, we are targeted and pressured into silence. Um, and it sometimes works because you obviously have to think about your family members and it's a good leverage. But um, other times it doesn't work and we are trying everything to not um, give in to the pressure. Thanks, Imratai. I think that your personal testimony, that of your family, that of um, Dolkan Isa, really does shed light on the extent to which the Chinese government is willing to go in order to stifle any critical voices overseas, any voices um, seeking to bring truth about the situation that's happening for those living under Chinese rule. Um, and as we know that the targeting of activists is, is only part and parcel of China's efforts to shut down any international discussion of what is happening in East Turkestan, in Tibet, in Hong Kong, in mainland China. Um, and on that point, I'd like to invite um, Kinzum from the Australian Tibet Council to jump in here and to, to build on really a lot of the points that you've made and highlight how China is seeking to influence Australia's national affairs and what's happening there on the national context. 
Yeah, th thanks, Gloria. Uh, so I will uh, talk about what is happening in Australia uh, because it has been the laboratory for China's influence. Uh, it is here where we saw the very early and extreme examples of Chinese influence on politics or education or for the purpose of tonight's discussion, you know, it is propaganda, you know. Um, so China has spent, as we just saw, you know, spent enormous amount of resources in reshaping the media landscape and, you know, basically shaping public opinion about about China. And what is unique about Australia um, is that, you know, um, one in every uh, 25 people in Australia is, is a Chinese person, someone who came from China or has strong links uh, with families or businesses in China, or someone, you know, who has been here for many, many um, in, uh, decades. Um, so, so the Chinese government is basically able to, you know, take advantage of that Chinese diaspora and really um, use, you know, the United Front work um, agencies here in Australia. And um, the Chinese population, many of which uh, are Mandarin reading people, they rely on the Chinese media that is controlled by the Chinese government. And so I think that is uh, unique uh, here in Australia, um, you know, that there is such a, a vibrant Chinese media, Chinese community media, all controlled by the Chinese government. So even though they live in a free and democratic Aust country like Australia, the information that they are getting is all from China. And that's how their you know, um, opinion is shaped. Uh, and that's how they are influenced their local elected representatives. And um, and because Australia has been uh, this ground zero for China's influence, I think you know it can share some lessons. It can serve as a warning to the rest of the world. And the biggest lesson uh, or the biggest mistake uh, that Australia has made uh, over the years that it has uh, was that that it has made itself so economically reliant on one single country, you know, China, a country like China. Australia made itself so vulnerable to China's economic blackmail, as we can see today. You know, even from a business perspective, uh, it, it was such a bad business practice, you know, not to diversify. And, and we are seeing that, you know, unfolding um, today. And what has happened in this country is both sides of politics have shown poor leadership in handling the China relationship. It was a relationship purely driven, um, you know, mainly driven by fear or greed. And so what has been concerning to the Tibet movement here is that, you know, visible support for the Tibet issue has diminished just as China's influence has risen over, over the past decade. So this is not an accident. You know, it is many years of China cultivating these relationships, co-opting the political elites, co-opting uh, academics, um, likewise our uh, business uh, leaders. So you will hear these business leaders, uh, political leaders, really le using the language of the CCP, you know, to protect their own uh, interests. And um, so, you know, really it, has, it is only in the last two, three years that there has been a real reckoning in this country. And this is why, you know, the government is prepared to be a bit more kind of ballsy to ch challenge China's influence, um, whether it is through passing um, the foreign interference legislation um, two years ago, or more recently, you know, calling for a global inquiry into the coronavirus origins. So what I want to say is that, you know, we are in a critical moment uh, right now. Uh, China's relationship uh, with the whole world has never been under greater scrutiny. Um, and, and, um, and as we can see, you know, China has spent these resources on its propaganda in telling the world China's story, and it has really overreached. So countries are pushing back, uh, in, and quite rightly so. And so there has been a huge shift in public perception of China. Uh, likewise, there's the huge shift taking place in the China debate among a political class. And so for the Tibet movement, 
our job is to ensure that Tibet is part of this ongoing conversation and ongoing new understanding of China. And as Tibetans, Uyghurs, or human rights defenders, our job is to ensure that our voices are heard, which is great that you know, we are able to launch this campaign today. Thanks, Keen Zoom. Um, of course, China's influence in Australia has also received renewed attention recently in light of the expulsion of student activist Drew Pavlo. Um, so from the University of Queenstown, um, Queensland in relation to his activism on campus. And Drew is, of course, here with us today. Um, I think that it would be really nice now if Drew could come in a little bit and share about his personal experience of what has happened. You know, what happened to you, Drew, when you tried to speak out at your university about China's human rights record um, and overseas influence? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much, Glory, for having me. Um, thanks so much to the International Tibet Network for having me. It's really humbling to be on this great panel with all these experts. I'm no expert myself, but um, I guess I've got the unique vantage point that as an activist, I've been personally uh, targeted and condemned by Chinese state media, which is a very weird position to be in as a 21-year-old random Australian guy. Um, it began, I guess, last year in July. Um, I sort of led a pro-Hong Kong democracy um, protest on campus. Um, at that protest, we were kind of surrounded by supporters of the Chinese government and we were like sort of, sort of violently attacked. Um, in the aftermath of that kind of um, violent attack, China, um, the, the Global Times, a Chinese state media outlet, um, labelled me, I guess, um, labelled me a separatist. They named me um, as the organiser of the protest. Um, they posted my image and my sort of details online and denounced me as a separatist, which is, um, I guess, one of the gravest crimes you can be accused of in China. It's a, it's a higher crime than, I mean, rape, murder, pedophilia, to be accused of separatism. If you're convicted of that in China, you can be sent to death. It's a capital offence. So um, after being labelled a separatist um, for sort of leading this protest in favour of Hong Kong, Uyghurs, Tibetans, um, yeah, like there was a sort of vast campaign uh, levelled against me online by supporters of the Chinese government. Um, they sort of targeted me with death threats, um, targeted my family with death threats. There were some really violent, vile comments kind of directed towards my family that were really terrifying, threats to rape, torture um, my mother, torture my family, uh, murder my family, find my address. And, um, you know, when this occurred, I was only 20. It was a really terrifying thing to experience for the first time. I'd never been prepared for it. Um, I was never previously very heavily involved in the sort of issues surrounding the Chinese government. So I never expected that I would come under that sort of, um, I guess, pressure. And there was a kind of, um, it was really an attempt to try and silence people through, uh, like, through intimidation. It's a bullying tactic, it's a terror tactic to try and silence people, um, to try and stop them from speaking out even in foreign countries like Australia, even in democracies like Australia. It's an attempt to try and um, terrify people into, um, into I guess, no longer speaking out for Hong Kong, Tibet, Uyghurs. Um, that's why I guess it's so important that we do take a stand against Chinese state media outlets. Um, you know, as you said recent, as you said in the inter introduction, um, they don't pay The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, The City Morning Herald. They're not paying these um, papers out of charity. Um, and these papers aren't, ex aren't accepting them um, and their newspaper editorials in their own papers. They're not accepting like Global Times and China Daily in their papers um, because they support Chinese social, socialism with Chinese characteristics and Xi Jinping thought or whatever. It's purely money and simply for, I guess, the bottom dollar, bottom line, the, the dollar, people are selling out human rights. And it, it's, it's a terrifying thing because um, when you are targeted by these state media outlets, it can be um, something that's really scary. It's, a, it's um, something that no one should ever experience because they're, they're, they try and terrify people into silence. Really, we, we shouldn't have any um, international media outlets doing business with these types of thuggish, uh, thuggish propaganda outlets that really um, exist simply as a mouthpiece of this 
for this totalitarian dictatorship that operates concentration camps in, on a mass scale that is persecuting people in a genocide in, in Xinjiang, East Turkestan. Thank you, Drew. Thanks for sharing um, your personal experience. I think that given, as you said, that China's political model is based on an authoritarian regime, it's not surprising that efforts to export China's influence are geared towards expanding that very model, um, which includes upholding those repressive tactics that the Chinese government has long exercised domestically to stifle freedom of speech, to censor any criticism of the Chinese government, and to intimidate and harass those who speak out. Um, and as you mentioned, if, if convicted in, in China under, under separatist charges, that is a state security crime. Um, I know at the moment you've been expelled from university for your activism. Um, in China, you would be um, behind bars for doing so, for doing nothing more than, than raising awareness about what is happening. Um, I know, Sophie, you've been working on the human rights situation in China for many, many years now. What have you noticed in terms of China's growing influence in recent years? And why is this such a worrying trend? Sure. First of all, it's it's great to be here, and it is awfully hard to improve on uh, all of the thoughtful presentations that people have made. And uh, and I, I also want to convey to my fellow panelists who've really personally suffered as a result of of these kinds of encroachments. Um, you know, we feel like we work to roll back these kinds of problems and challenge them. Uh, I mean, it's very clear that the Chinese government and the Communist Party are trying to quite methodically exploit open spaces and, and the avenues that democracies are meant to leave open uh, for discussion to present this worldview in which black is white and up is down, Tibet is a democracy, Uyghurs are free. You know, we've manipulated discussion to make the world only see that which the Chinese government wants it to see. And I think it's very disturbing to listen to the list of institutions that that everyone has spoken about, whether it's traditional media, whether it's about people who are citizens of other countries and that by virtue of that citizenship should have, you know, clear rights to live free of persecution and, and to be able to uh, you know, report harassment and have that be effectively responded to, or even institutions like universities. I want to quickly add two other, uh, you know, realms that I think we should be concerned about. One is uh, Chinese-backed uh, global social media platforms, or, or you know, things like WeChat. We wrote last year about a Canadian MP who had been using WeChat to communicate with her Chinese speaking constituents in Canada, and that was censored. You know, the idea that a democratically elected politician can't even communicate with her own constituents free of being censored by Beijing, I think should, among other things, mobilize politicians around what platforms they use and think about uh, you know, encouraging the creation of alternatives. Uh, but Zomreti mentioned earlier, uh, some of the issues surrounding access to the UN Human Rights Council and you know, the Chinese government's systematic efforts to keep, not just keep critical voices out of that forum, but indeed to start rewriting uh, really anti-free speech or rewriting norms so that there's less room there for free speech. Um, but I do want to come back to this discussion about uh, the media, and particularly to congratulate uh, uh, that you know some gains have been scored at least with Le Soir, and to talk about you know what people can think about doing with respect to uh, you know what are supposed to be respectable media outlets that take money to run Chinese government propaganda. And I was delighted to see one of my own grumpy tweets. Uh, in, in, in John's presentation earlier, a few things make me angrier than opening, you know, the, the two newspapers we get delivered 365 days a year uh, to find a China Daily insert. And, you know, my own personal response to that is not just to tweet and shame the media outlet that's done that, uh, but I also on those days refuse to tweet or engage with those media outlets at all, and that's a bit that's, that's something of a, of a you know a sacrifice on HRW's part because we work a lot with journalists to try to get messages out for sure. 
Um, but I've also found that, 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 frankly, sending the newspapers back uh, to the publishers on the days when they run those inserts certainly generates at least a little bit of attention. I would urge others to do that. And I would really encourage people, you know, either on behalf of your organization or simply as readers, call the publishers, write to them, ask them why they do this, push them to change their policies because many of them will sort of fall back on policies they have about paid advertising and what they can and can't reject or whether they are stuck in contracts that they say they can't renegotiate. I think really pushing them uh, is one of the ways to try to get them to change because we all know that often, you know, the, the, the journalists at these outlets who cover China are often horrified and very unhappy uh, that, that their own employers essentially are, are helping prop up the problem rather than pushing back against it. And I think there's a lot of room for individuals like us and organizations like ours to really call the owners and the, and the editors of these papers out uh, for doing this. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, I think this is a great campaign, eager to help support it, and hopefully there will be uh, lots of questions for us to talk about uh, in our remaining time together this morning. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I think it's really crucial that you added some of those comments about China's attempts to influence through social media apps. Um, and really reinforcing efforts by the Chinese government to silence voices seeking to use what should be safe spaces in international human rights forums to be bringing awareness to what is happening, using those forums as, as a platform to actually intimidate and harass. I'd like to build on all of these discussions that we've been having um, and move to a Q&A session now. Um, perhaps as a first question, which I could initially um, pose to Zumratai um, and also others who'd like to come into it, whether you can tell us a little bit about what are um, the Chinese government's efforts to, are there efforts to influence democratic countries being successful? We see that it's happening on such a mass scale. We see that it's targeting all of these different institutions. Are they being successful? Um, thank you. Um, I don't know if they're being successful, so I, I would say partly maybe, but I think mostly they're successful in targeting um, individuals um, more than like states in general. Um, so I know that Chinese, Chinese governments uh, often, you know, um, target like uh, individuals who have the power to, to, you know, to do something and then they will um, maybe influence them to take a decision. But I don't think they're being successful in, in terms of um, influencing countries, democratic countries. Uh, I know that especially, you know, if we look at the Confucius Institutes over the past years, um, a lot of, you know, civil society have been very active in um, working uh, to kind of expose what they really are. It's just a Chinese uh, propaganda outlet that is you know, has expanded over um, the past years in, in different countries, especially in democratic countries like Australia. I know they're very important there. In Canada, even in Canada, we had a lot of them. Um, and I know that over the last uh, fall, many of them were closed in um, Brussels because they found out how, um, you know, some of them were spying, um, for the Chinese government and also in the States there was a campaign also run by SFD and Tibetan groups and there was huge vic victories over the past years. Um, so I think like civil society is really vital to um, kind of expose these and like ex expose China and the, their threats and um, how they're influencing individuals. Um, so I think um, they're successful only in uh, like partly and uh if we do keep especially with these kind of campaigns um i think we can be successful um in like combating their narrative and combating their um, influence thanks Imratai. are there any other comments um anyone would like to come in on that i'll move to um another question then that we've got through which is um so one of the difficulties we have in maximizing political pressure on China's propaganda is that many of those who want the same outcomes as we do um, tend to be um, right wing politicians with whom we will disagree with on on many other issues. 
what's the best way to navigate through that challenge? Perhaps, um, Drew, you can you can come in on that initially, and then we can open it up to the wider panel to to sort of discuss as well. Yeah, sure. Um, it's I'm I'm kind of in an interesting uh, position because I myself identify it's coming um, to like I guess my criticism of the Chinese state from a left wing perspective. For me, it's all about human rights, human dignity, um, like. The belief that all lives are equal in value worth and that's why you know we need to be fighting for tibetans hong kongers uyghurs even though these horrible human rights atrocities are occurring overseas um so i come from i come to the um the issue from a left-wing perspective perspective and then i guess over the course of my activism um a surprising thing that has sort of like um like made its made itself uh sort of known to myself is like I guess right wing politicians sort of backing me and especially in my case um there was even even a time where uh the anti islam uh sort of far right far right politician Pauline Hansen at one point endorsed me and um that was not necessarily like you know a welcome endorsement because um I just fundamentally disagree with her on almost every single issue I think it's really difficult because um I don't think we have really credibility criticizing the chinese government's human rights abuses when um, when it comes, when if at home we are completely ignoring human rights abuses, um, and in fact even like you know outright advocating for them, I mean in the case of uh, Pauline Hanson, um, she supported the Australian government's atrocious uh, refugee policies, which have seen you know refugees tortured in offshore offshore prison camps for years now. Um, you know, twelve-year-old girls have been raped by Nauruan prison guards. Um, there have been young girls who have sewed their mouths shut, um, young girls who have set themselves on fire because the conditions in these prison camps that the Australian government operates are just so atrocious. And this is like you know a heavily racialized thing. It's um, it's really it's really to do I think with the fact that a lot of these refugees are Muslim and come from non-white backgrounds and stuff. So I I really find I really struggle there. I don't think you know you have much credibility criticizing the Chinese government. On human rights abuses whatsoever, especially like you know when it comes to Uyghurs, when you know you support your own government basically carrying out its own sort of uh, watered down version of the Chinese state's terrible authoritarian practices. I think we really need to be cr like consistent in all of our human rights activism, and um, it, like if we're just sort of, I think you know it, those types of right wing politicians who um, claim to care about human rights abuse in China yet. They at home they're completely silent on these issues and in fact you know support police brutality against Black Lives Matters protests and and the what and whatnot. I think those protesters do a terrible. I mean I I think those um those pol those far right politicians those right wing politicians um they they're really damaging the the fight to like you know call the Chinese government's human rights abuses into account because it just plays straight into Chinese government propaganda that oh these people don't care about human rights in fact they're just sort of like anti China. I think we really need to be a bit careful um, who we have as allies in this whole thing. I think the fundamental thing is it has to be about, like, you know, human rights, human dignity. It has to be about, you know, standing with the Chinese people against the Chinese government rather than attacking or demonizing the Chinese people themselves. And we have to, like, you know, be careful that we are not allying ourselves with politicians who, in other areas, um, are like more than happy to support human rights abuses. Thanks, Drew. I think calls for consistency um, are really, really important. Um, John, do you want to, if you've got anything that maybe you might want to add on that as well? You may be on mute, just uh, as a warning. If, if John isn't there, there might be someone else from the panel who is keen to sort of come in and discuss building on some of Drew's points. And um, I know many of you are, are forced to work, will we'll work with a range of different stakeholders um, to, to raise concerns that is um, human rights situation. For those living under Chinese rule, how do you navigate that landscape? I'm happy to chime in a little bit. I mean, in, in, and you know, I guess my views are somewhat similar to what Drew has just articulated. You know, Human Rights Watch carries out its analyses and activism according to what international human rights law requires and dictates. 
And, you know, to the extent that one, you know, is, is working in coalitions or loosely together with others, you know, it, you, you, you certainly, you know, if the world allowed us to perfectly shape all of our partners, <laughs> you know, we, we might be having a very different kind of conversation. But, uh, you know, sometimes people from different parts of the political spectrum uh, align on a particular issue. And I think then the question is really whether, uh, you know, other partners, you know, have, uh, you know, reputational problems. I mean, in a way, the, uh, you know, the, the Trump administration, I think, is, is a good example of this in the sense that there's been, you know, lots of very forceful public rhetoric about China. But I think the motivation for a great deal of that you know, has absolutely nothing to do with human rights whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, the administration pursues some loathsome rights violating policies. And to that end, I will just point out to everybody listening that uh, in a matter of minutes, the UN's Human Rights Council is going to start its uh, urgent session to discuss racism and police brutality. It's, it's sort of couched as being a global discussion, but it really is focused on the US. And it's I think it just underscores the importance of having bodies like that internationally that can uphold those standards and oblige the world to have those conversations. Thanks for that, Sophie. Are there any other comments from, from panelists on that? I'd just say like, I really agree, like read those comments on the Trump administration. It's sometimes the case that like a lot of supporters of Hong Kong and other you know, pro-democracy movements in China have been quite sympathetic to the Trump administration because he's been very tough on China. Um, but I don't believe, like, you know, his interests are in it for the right reasons. I don't believe, like, you know, Trump cares one iota for human rights. I mean, like, when, I mean, like, he's he's at times just, like, denounced the Hong Kong protesters as rioters. He's, like, he's on many occasions, you know, trumpeted tr Chinese government propaganda points all because he wanted trade deals with the Chinese government. I think like we need to like really assess what are people's motivations when they're calling out the Chinese government. And we really need to make sure like when they do cr call out the Chinese government, their motivations are a g out of a genuine concern for human rights. I think if they're not out of a genuine concern for human rights, then it's very difficult to ally them and then maintain our credibility as human rights activists. Thanks, Drew. Kim do you have anything you'd like to add on that? Oh, so I'll just add into the, you know, referencing the Australian context too. Yeah, I think, um, yes, uh, others have already uh, expressed my views, but just to add um, to that, um, yes, definitely it is a tricky, um, you know, thing to navigate. Um, but um, I think, you know, the, the tragedy is, you know, is, is not why the right wing uh, people are supporting issues such as Tibet or Istanbul or Hong Kong, but the tragedy is why the progressives have not been able to come on board with this. That's very true. And and that's 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 deeply frustrating, you know, uh, and and it's something that we we have to work with. Um, so yeah, I'll just add it here. I couldn't agree more with that point. I agree so much. Like, even like as a leftist, it's so disappointing that like you know so many left wing parties in Australia have like refused to come out and back me against UQ's attempt to expel me, and like most of the support comes from the right, and it just like really makes me question where is the left on this? And I think unfortunately it's because like the Chinese government has been so effective at weaponizing like you know claims of racism and stuff like that, and it's so effective at using that as a propaganda tool that unfortunately for the left, it becomes this completely toxic issue when in reality there are these terrible human rights violations that are ongoing and that really need to be addressed. Definitely. Um, can I, I'm going to, I think John's maybe having some some issues um, getting through on this, on this discussion still, um, the joys of us all working remotely and from home. Um, obviously pose sometimes problems when it comes to things like um, internet connection. But moving on to, to another question, um, speaking of COVID and some of the challenges we face, COVID has obviously put extra, extraordinary financial pressure 
on media outlets as well, with many journalists being furloughed um, and has also brought China related issues under the spotlight. Which do you think are the newspaper owners and editors um, that will jump in terms of sponsorship opportunities from China Daily um, at the moment, given the, the current context? And, and why do you think that? Um, so no, it's about the China. So I was a bit distracted. So it's about whether um, the Chinese government will um, increase its propaganda um, in the wake of COVID, right? And um, will increase, and also whether um, newspapers and international media outlets will succumb to um, the appeals of sponsorships from the Chinese government, given the financial pressures and implications of the current pandemic. Yeah, definitely. I think that will, you know, increase, you know, this strategy, um, the Chinese government global propaganda strategy. Um, it hasn't started recent. I mean, it hasn't started, you know, in the past year. So it has been going on since 2008. You know, it was a carefully developed global strategy to tell China's story to the world. And in the wake of the coronavirus crisis, we saw how the Chinese government has been quickly able to, you know, uh, intensify its propaganda machine, and that will only uh, increase uh, definitely in the coming months and years, as as a lot of, you know, as you mentioned, uh, newspapers, uh, you know, regional. Uh, national here in Australia, a lot of regional newspapers are shutting down because of the lack of advertising from various industries. So the Chinese government will find a way or will definitely look to, you know, exploit the commercial, you know, vulnerabilities of these media outlets. And, and which is why, you know, this is such a critical time for us to get our voices heard, you know, as consumers of these products, as citizens. Um, and, 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 um, so, yes, that's why I think, you know, this campaign is so important to get our voices out there, uh, you know, as China's reputation is taking such a massive hit, it will definitely intensify its propaganda uh, efforts. And, you know, right now China is fighting too many battles, you know, China is picking too many fights with too many groups and people and countries. Um, so, yes, China will intensify, you know, whatever it is doing uh, to influence foreign policy to, you know, uh, to, to um, intimidate or threaten, um, you know, countries with the economy, uh, you know, um, corrupt business leaders, everything. But we should also know that, you know, China has too many weaknesses at the right time, too many problems to handle. And um, so even though, you know, it all seems, you know, very overwhelming, the amount of propaganda that China is throwing at the world. I think, um, yes, we, we have to go into this campaign thinking that we really have a good chance. Thanks, Kinzum. Are there any other comments to be added on that? Corey, could I just add, I want to give a shout out to some fantastically creative advocacy done by the wonderful group Safeguard Defenders, along with the former British journalist Peter Humphreys, who was arbitrarily detained and tortured uh, and was one of several uh, victims of having an enforced, uh, an enforced confession recorded and broadcast. And what they've now done is actually taken a case before the Broadcasting Standards Board in the UK to make the case that China Global Television should be stripped of its license for having broadcast this kind of material. And I think one other tactic or, or, or strategy that people might want to think about is to look at what sort of standards actually exist. This is very different in different countries. Uh, but, you know, to the extent that you could make the case that these are not just sort of benign propaganda outlets that run falsehoods, but that actually, you know, run stories based on information obtained through torture or you know, other human, that, that they, they are premised on human rights violations in the production of their news. Uh, I think that's, that's a pretty powerful tool in addition to really holding the leadership of media outlets accountable. Thanks, Sophie. I mean, it goes without saying as well, um, in the UK, uh, just last month in May, um, Ofcom found that 
that CS, um, CGNT had um, promoted biased coverage of, of the Hong Kong protests. And a uh, similar thing has been found by the Belgian Council of um, Journalistic Ethics with the daily newspaper Le Soir, who um, they said didn't actually properly label um, promotional content from um, Chinese press agencies. So it's definitely something that even um, international regulators, national regulators are, are discovering and are taking action on um, in an attempt to reduce China's um, influence over biased news coverage. Um, we've spoken about um, the influence of the CCP and how far reaching it seems into companies, into universities, into our media outlets. But what about the UN? Is there anything that they can do on this front? I fear that query is coming to me. If you'd be so inclined to answer. But I mean, other people have, have yeah. experience of, of these institutions as well. I think you know, the, our, our concerns range all the way from the level of who has access to UN human rights institutions, which is everything from who, which NGOs can get accreditation to be able to participate, or even, as Zorante has reminded us, even if you do have accreditation, you know, will Chinese diplomats ask UN security to frog march you out of the building? Uh, you know, all the way through to who can submit what kinds of information to different kinds of UN review processes, to pushing back against the Chinese government's clear efforts to shut down different avenues to participation and to impo increasingly imposing its own views about what those UN human rights mechanisms should do and how they should function. Um, I have to say that uh, you know, we find that the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has been uh, very weak in pushing back against the Chinese government about just about everything. Uh, I think you know, the High Commissioner is, it's, it's still relatively early days for her. Uh, and I think you know, there's a lot of discussion about the US, there's a lot of discussion about China, two big players. Uh, I think that makes it tough for high commissioners to choose a path, but she has called for, for example, access to Uyghur regions to be able to investigate violations there. Uh, there's been some brilliant work done by the different UN special human rights experts, you know, who look at issues ranging from human rights defenders to the freedom of expression, arbitrary detention, and I think making appeals to and providing information to those bodies is quite helpful. But it's also critical that a group of rights respecting governments come together now and commit to a roughly five to 10 year plan to making sure that those UN institutions remain open, truly open for real defense of human rights because nobody's really presenting the kind of counterweight to the anti-rights agenda that China is advancing. Thanks, Sophie. Um, I mean, I know, Zumrata, you spoke in quite in depth as well about the challenges that the World Uyghur Congress and, and other activists have been having at the UN. Um, what do you think they can do about this influence? Have, have, have they done much when it comes to Dolkan's case, when it comes to preventing activists accessing forums? Forums, sorry. Yeah, so just to build on uh, Sophie's point, I mean, China has really been deploying tactics uh, to limit free speech inside the UN by, uh, you know, harassing the activists or even sending note verbals to many states, preventing activists to meet with missions or states, um, and or you know, sending these uh, uh, gurgos, uh governmental sponsored uh, NGOs inside the UN. I remember I I was at the UN Forum for Minority Issues in November, and right after I, I had spoken about the um, the lack of um, Uyghur language as for education for Uyghurs, um, they, there was this Chinese uh, lady from Agongo that 
completely contradicted my point. And, you know, all these tactics or like when you go to side events, uh, you can't really do. I know that uh, our president try to um, ask questions to the experts who were there from the Uyghur region and they were, you know, um, afraid to talk or they were not allowed to to answer and they deliberately even avoided him or many other Uyghur activists. And, you know, it's just also how China is occupying space inside the UN. Um, I know that in March, in, during the biggest Human Rights Council session, they did a, like a photo exhibition about uh, ethnic and religious harmony inside East Turkestan. And they had all of this in, in front of the, like where, Every uh, diplomat, every official hangout, like in a cafe where everyone can see. They, I mean, they've done this before in the previous years as well. And this is something that um, the UN has to take a stand on. Um, I mean, they're occupying all the space. And then NGOs like us, we're having trouble having accreditation or um, even obtaining equal sex status. And when we do have accreditation, um, China uses their uh, pressure or their influence to try to limit us or even limit the organizations, the NGOs that give us accreditation. So really, the UN has not been very vocal about this. And even there has been some, um, you know, blockage when it came to um, getting uh accountability from the UN. Um, so the work that has been done until now, it's really mainly from civil society. Um, so he, like uh, NGOs who have been vocal about this, about uh, reprisals. So um, like Sophie said, like Antonio Guterres has been very awful in speaking up again. Of this. So we hope and we expect more from UN um, on civil society access to this platform. The UN should definitely be expanding the space available for activists to speak. And unfortunately, in many instances, we find that the space is shrinking for, for many. Um, I want to have one last question before we finish this discussion, just bringing it back as well to, to um, China's influence over our media. Um, we mentioned that there are a range of media outlets that are being targeted. Um, for their China um, China Watch inserts or Beijing Review inserts. Um, as The Economist, um, and maybe, John, you might be best placed to answer this and provided you are unable to respond, perhaps Mandy can answer, but has The Economist been approached with regards to their co cooperation with China Daily? I fear, Mandy, you might have to come in on this one. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that John is having difficulties with his mic because he, he would have a lot to say on this issue. Um, so, yes, uh, The Economist has been um, approached directly. We have actually this week sent a uh, joint letter from over 120 um, NGOs from around the world who are targeting not just the Economist, but also the Sydney Morning Herald, um, the, the Wall Street Journal, and the German um, media publication called Handelsblatt. Um, we have written the letters. Uh, we also have a new petition which is going live today um, which will be specifically targeting those outlets. Um, we haven't had any feedback as yet to any of the letters that have gone out. Um, but as you know, both John and Sophie were raising earlier, there are a number of kind of figures that, that do reach out to these um, publications constantly raising the fact that it is wrong that they are t that they are holding this paid propaganda um, and not just that they are holding it and making money from it but they are making it seem as though this is this is informative information which is being shared with their their readers um, so yes the answer is that the 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 economist has been targeted and is being targeted and we are we are asking to have a meeting um, with the editor um, to see if we can have a more open discussion about our concerns about this. Thanks, Mandy, and thanks to um, all of the panellists for joining us today and for the questions that were submitted. 
Um, although this is the launch of this new global campaign, Cancel China Propaganda, these talks um, that are organized by the International Tibet Network are part of a series. So there will be more opportunities to ask questions about the human rights situation facing those living under Chinese rule um, and China's influences overseas. I'm going to hand back over to Mandy so that she can make um, any final remarks about how we can find out more about the campaign um, before she goes ahead and closes off the session. So thanks, everyone, for taking part. And Mandy, I hand back to you. Thanks, Gloria. I just wanted to really uh, quickly show the audience who are obviously uh, very interested in the idea of being able to target these, these media outlets. I wanted to show the new petition um, that I raised is being launched today. I'm going to very quickly share my screen so you can see it. Um, so this is a new uh, petition website, cancelchinapropaganda.org. And on here, you will find a petition which, like I was saying, targets the Wall Street Journal, Handelsblatt, Sydney Morning Herald and The Economist at the moment. Um, we do have plans to extend this campaign to target more media outlets because, as John's presentation raised, there are media outlets around the world, um, but we are starting off with these small ones. Um, the, the site also contains a number of different um, reports about the influence that China has in this kind of global propaganda campaign. Uh, there's a fantastic report by uh, Freedom House, which gives a, a wealth of information, and also The Guardian, which the map in John's presentation came from. The Guardian's piece is worth watching. Uh, and I, I highly recommend that you go and take the, take the petition, sign up now, um, add your voice, make sure that we are able to reach out to these media outlets and really let them know that we're unhappy about what's happening. Um, and we will keep you updated. We, like I say, we've um, asked for a meeting between uh, a number of global Tibet groups, but also Uyghur groups as well. Well, Uyghur Congress and Campaign for Uyghurs are also involved. Um, and if we hear anything back and we have these meetings, we will certainly keep you updated. Um, but there will be more actions to come as we move through this brand new campaign. Um, so the last thing to add is just, again, a huge thanks to our audience. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for um, posting questions. And thank you so much to our panel for once again uh, being a wealth of knowledge and interest. Um, and that's it. Thanks, Thanks. everyone for joining. Thank you, Thank you. for joining. See Thanks soon. for inviting us. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.